Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Online Accessibility, Keeping Social Media and Websites Compliant. We still have a few people dialing in, so we're going to give them another moment or so and then we'll get started. Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar, Online Accessibility, Keeping Social Media and Websites Compliant. I very much want to thank you for taking the time to learn about our subject today and see our speaker, John Brett, discuss his ideas and his experiences as the Communication Director for Falls Church City Public Schools. This webinar is part of our agency to agency webinar series where we talk to some of the best and brightest in public sector communication from police officers to school administrators to other government agencies to hear what they're doing and the tips and tricks on best practices. Today's webinar, of course, features John Brett. And then if you're excited, we have our next webinar already set up with Alex Bowman discussing COVID-19 and some of the best of online resources. But let's get on to today's webinar. In today's agenda, we have John Brett hitting us off with talking about accessibility and keeping social media and websites compliant for 508 and ADA compliance. Next, we'll have uh, Ray Carey discuss legal policy and public records and how to remain social media compliant for public records guidance. And my name is Jessica Parker and I will be your moderator today. And everybody, this is Ray. I would say uh, I know many of us are working from home, so to thank you for taking the time out. I will also say that uh, I think I have my uh, my dog and everything else sort of sorted. Uh, but uh, John, um, you know, if uh, if we have background noise or the or the door or what have you, we'll we'll excuse all because we know we're uh, we're working in in extraordinary times. So um, uh, we'll do our best to keep the audio clean. Not a problem. <laughs> Absolutely. And speaking of extraordinary times, we have a lot to cover today. So we want to hear from you first on what topics you want to make sure are covered and what topics you really want to dive into. So you should be seeing a poll on your screen now. Yep, just gets up. Fantastic. All right. While you are answering those questions, I'm going to go ahead and go over some housekeeping rules. Now, all attendees are on mute to try and limit that background noise. I know Ray is not the only one working from home today. There will be time for a Q&A following the presentation. I know a few of you sent in questions beforehand, and you can use the control panel on your screen to answer to uh, produce questions live. And we will be following today's webinar with resources from John Brett and from the Archive Social team. We've got 73% of voted. Give it another second or so. All right, it looks like voting has come in. Let's go ahead and see some of those results. So most of us are excited to learn about accessibility on websites and social media. Social media and public records compliance is gonna be a huge uh, interest level today. And a few of you are interested a little bit more about crisis management and COVID-19. Ray or John, before I get too far, do you have anything to add about so, uh, the good news is everybody's on the right webinar and we invited the right fella so thank you uh we just always check this uh we just check this at the beginning to make sure that we are frankly on topic and all of these uh uh four are addressed uh, i've seen uh john's materials and so john i think it's really across the board and then um if people want to talk about crisis management uh we have not just a separate webinar but we're doing a lot of that um uh, you know, right now with our with our clients, and so if people want to ask questions either at the end of the uh, at the end of this session or follow up specifically uh, with me or us, I'm happy to uh, talk through what we are seeing and also put you in touch with some social media uh, 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 managers at you know large cities that uh, that are handling this sort of day to day. So we're happy to make that connection as well. So with that, I'll pass it back to you, Jessica. All right, excellent. Let's go ahead and dive in. Let's learn a little bit more about our lovely speakers today. John Wesley love Brett. It. Yes, fantastic <laughs> and lovely. I'm so excited to read your biography. There's some interesting tidbits in here for our audience members. 
So John Brett is the Director of Communications and Online Accessibility Officer for the Falls Church City Public Schools. John leads the creation of accessible communications through websites, newsletters, mobile apps, and social media for the International Baccalaureate Continuum Division. And if that wasn't impressive enough, he also has skills in design and modification of the content management systems, along with programming in PHP and JavaScript. And before arriving at FCCPS in 2006, John led a decades long career in both radio and television news in Raleigh, North Carolina, Lexington, Kentucky, and Washington, DC. He is an Emmy winning former television anchor and investigative reporter known for his conversational style of storytelling. John's series of reports on the identification of a murder victim found 30 years prior in Georgetown, Kentucky, was recently featured in an episode entitled Tent Girl in the Who Killed Jane Doe series on the Investigative Discovery Cable Channel. If that's not a lovely speaker, I don't know who that is. Well, all that proves is I can't keep a job. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it also proves you have some fantastic insights to give us. So without further, further ado, I'm going to go ahead and kick it over to you. Hey, can you see my screen? I yeah, can we're seeing it fine. Do I need to move the tool off the screen? No, in fact, uh, uh, that we can control on our end. So gotcha. it's, okay. it's you've got the full screen here. It looks great. All right. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm uh, John Brett, Communications Director and Accessibility Officer here at Falls Church City Public Schools. We're in Northern Virginia. We're about five miles as the Eagles flies from the Washington Monument. And I thought we'd start with just a five minute crash course. And I promise you no more than five minutes on accessibility because I think it is imperative that we first understand what online accessibility is. And if we know what it is, then it's always a good reminder to remind ourselves why we're doing these things. Online accessibility is the ability of users with impairments to read content on websites, on mobile devices and digital documents, such as PDFs, spreadsheets, uh, slide presentations, etc. And by impairments, we mean those users who are blind or have low vision, have mobility difficulties, are deaf or hard of hearing, or have cognitive impairments. So not only is this an altruistic act to remove online barriers to these and others, it's also the law, and actually two laws. The most recent being the ADA, which guarantees those with impairments and disabilities have the same opportunities as everyone else to participate in American life. But a much older law actually is more relevant to online accessibility. 37 years ago, Congress approved the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, and Section 508 of that act required access for both members of the public and employees, and this is key, to technologies when they are developed, maintained, or used by federally funded agencies. Now, this is 18 years before the internet went public in August of 1991. And Section 508 is a must do for you if you work for the federal government, a public school system, a nonprofit organization, or other entity receiving federal funding. Now, although Section 508 requires access to technologies to employees and the public, it does not spell out exactly what that access looks like. And that's why we have WCAG 2.1, or the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. These were created and updated by the same group that governs the internet, Sir Tim Berners-Lee and the World Wide Web Consortium. These guidelines offer specifics for best practices for, oops, sorry, best practices for online accessibility. And there are four principles, the first being perceivable. That is that the user can see or sense the content through hearing, seeing, or using some sort of accessible assistant technology. And also that the content is operable, that a user can interact with that content and that it is understandable which is pretty obvious, and that it is also robust, that the standards, when they are placed as directed, that they work across technology. Again, the guidelines, while not codified yet into law, 
they're, and they're expected to be one day. And for those who aren't beholden to Section 508, following these guidelines have shown that they actually increase search engine optimization. And as a result, you rank better in Google. So under the four principles, there are 13 different guidelines. And the first and most important is principle number one, adding alternative text to non-text content. It's, the, again, the first principle of web accessibility. Anything in an app or website that isn't text needs a name or a description. And the most common use of alt text is describing images. Now, this is my dog Grover in his usual excited state. Uh, alternative text is read by screen readers, allowing this image to be accessible to those with visual or certain cognitive disabilities. It is also displaced in place of an uh, image when the user has not chosen to view images. Descriptions of images are also read by search engines. And when thinking of alternative text, context is king. Why is this image, why this image here is more important than a literal description. You do not want to use alternative text to say, this is a picture of a dog in a chair beside a table with books in a sunroom, etc." If this is used to illustrate a product, then the alt text would be a beagle comfortably sunning himself in a natural colored wicker chair from Ikea. If this, however, is to illustrate a rescue shelter, you would use alternative text such as, this is Grover curled up in his favorite chair. Also be succinct with your alternate text. Typically, no more than a few words are necessary, though in some cases, a short sentence may be appropriate. Don't be redundant or provide the same information that's already in the content and don't use, this is an image of or a graphic of. It's usually apparent to the user that it's an image. And even to the blind who screen, uh, screen readers announce that an image is here when it comes across the image tag, okay? So with that foundation on online accessibility and why we have to do it and should be doing it, let's dive in with some examples of how to do it. And I'm going to start with social media as there are very limited ways to enhance a user's experience currently. And with the remaining time, we will then jump into website accessibility where the sky is nearly the limit in what we're able to do. Let's start with Twitter. There are basically two things you can do to make your tweets more accessible. The first we talked about, adding alternative text to your image, and the other is camel casing hashtags. Now, before we can add alternative text to Twitter, though, you have to turn it on. Now, these instructions that I'm going to go over work both on the Twitter website as well as the Twitter mobile app, both in iPhone and Android. You go to the Twitter account, again, either in the website or your app, and navigate to settings and privacy, and then click on it. From here, you will see accessibility under the general settings. If you click that, and watch, happens, watch what happens to my screen. You, the accessibility gives you two options, increasing color contrast, which it did immediately. That's the old blue, this is the new blue and the lines are deeper color, easier to see for a low vision a user. And then compose image descriptions. You need to check at least compose image descriptions so you can add alternative text to an image. Once you're done with that, you can go to your tweets and when you add your image to the tweet, you will now have this little uh, icon saying add description to the bottom of the photo of the tweet. You click add description, and then you can add your description, duh. Uh, notice you have a ton more characters also available in the description than you have in the main tweet area. And those characters do not take away from the tweet characters. And when you get done, you're done. And now you have a tweet that is much more accessible than when you started. All of the popular platforms now offer alternative text, and I won't go into them, and, and we'll be sending you links to the tutorials in the back end of each of these platforms at the, uh, after the uh, program today. Instagram, when you're uploading the image, all you have to do is go to uh, advanced settings at the bottom of the upload screen, and from there, the last option is add alternative text. On Facebook, when you upload a photo, you can then hover over the thumbnail, and it will say edit photo. 
you click in there and you can add text. LinkedIn, when you upload an image to your feed, at the top right of the image, you can add the image description by clicking Add Description. Oh, and, and don't forget, screen readers such as JAWS and NVDA cannot detect text that's in an image or a meme or a GIF. So make sure when you're adding descriptions of the text in your images, put them in the image description. And while we're discussing alternative text, another form, of course, is subtitling or closed captioning. Subtitles on videos are vital for the hard of hearing and deaf community, and they actually provide for an even wider audience that would be missing out on your videos otherwise. How many times have you been in a restaurant and watched the closed captions so that you can uh, hear and understand what's happening on the television? But the problem is they need to be correct. Of the major public platforms right now, only YouTube currently auto-generates subtitled videos and does it with varying degrees of success, which we've just seen. YouTube does allow you, however, to go into the back end and correct them. Beyond that, you were left to third-party caption houses and apps that generate the subtitles, and then you can upload them. Uh, one new app that works well and has a free version is called Descript. Basically, you upload your video into this, it auto-generates the subtitle, and then you can tweak that and then output it as an SRT file, which is a subtitle file, and then you can upload that to YouTube or even into Facebook. Facebook also allows for live subtitles, but you have to work with a third-party company who has the rights to the Facebook video API. And for Instagram stories, there's an app called Cliptomatic that I understand is a great app that provides the captions for you on Instagram. It does cost a few dollars, but it's and it's only available on the iPhone. So that's it for subtitles, except for it is a requirement of WCAG, providing captions for video and live audio and providing text transcripts for all audio content. This must be done to be compliant. But there are also other benefits. YouTube allows videos to be searched by their captains. A non-disabled person that we just talked about can watch a video when audio would be rude, like in a sports bar or an airport. Transcripts uh, aids in translation. And studies show that those with disabilities are now finding YouTube as the go-to place to learn all sorts of ideas. And two more areas that are generally social media specific. These are hashtags and emojis. Now to make your hashtags accessible to screen readers and actually easier to read for low vision users and any users really, is to use camel case, or as we did with the word hashtag here, uh, capitalize each word in the hashtag. Now a quick story to show you the importance of this. With the passing of Margaret Thatcher, one organization caused now Thatcher is dead to trend on Twitter. The problem is instead of reading hashtag now Thatcher is dead, Twitterverse read it is now share is dead. That hashtag writer no doubt starts humming if I could only turn back the hands of time. Well, read over your hashtags before posting them because you never know what viral misunderstanding you could be causing. And another example of how Camel Case helps screen readers with a capital P, screen readers detect separate words, so they pronounce it hashtag iPhone. If it's a lowercase, then the screen reader pronounces it hashtag epiphany. And now to emojis, and there's really only one thing to mention about emojis here. The same or a couple of emojis over and over and over again can get very repetitive when using a screen reader. Make sure you limit your emoji use to one or two to get the point across, and then please give your user a break. Assistive technology allows that each uh, disability has its own assistive technology, and that's what makes the disability irrelevant. While I've been mentioning screen readers, that's just one of a whole family of assistive, technolo assistive technologies. And the purchase of use, purpose of using these technologies is obvious. To the contrary, if we don't do our part in making content accessible, then we are making the disability relevant. Perhaps you use assistive technology. I do. 
Let's discuss ways now to enhance the accessibility of digital content like websites and documents and presentations. This is the preferred format in digital content and they're in ranked order. HTML still reigns supreme primarily for its tagging. Assistive tech can identify text, images, buttons, links. It aids in translation. And under that is accessible PDFs, which is a lot different than any old PDF because it includes extensive uh, heading tags and other tagging that we'll be talking about in just a minute. Right now, Adobe Acrobat Pro DC is the standard for accessible PDF editing and creation. And below that is Word Docs and PowerPoints. Both are still a little clumsy when it comes to accessibility. They're kind of akin to a bad auto translate, but they're still better than nothing, but can be difficult for assistive technology to navigate. PowerPoints actually work better if you make them a PDF. And then there is anything else that you can come across with. Screen Reader will try it with varying success, but HTML always seems to work well. Being successful with assistive technology is all about the navigation. The Center for Persons with Disabilities at Utah State University, the WebAIM guys, asked assistive tech users when trying to find information on a lengthy document or web page, which of the following do you find uh, that you likely do first? And here are the results. Over 65% of the respondents use headings to navigate. Lesser to agree, they search or use find and then navigating links, landmarks, and reading the page. And let's talk about headings and their importance and how to use them. Headings allow someone using a screen reader to skip around all over the document and web page without having to have to hear every single word read to them. Additionally, you may have noticed that Google Docs is now using headings to create a table of contents on the fly, and that's pretty much the same thing. To use headings, you need to start at the top and work to the bottom. You should have at least one H1 level heading per document. Normally, it's the document title. And as I said, they serve as a, a table of contents and bookmarks. Now, do not skip heading levels. Don't go from, say, a heading two to a heading four. Go to heading two, then heading three, and a heading four. You can jump back to a heading two after you've introduced it the first time. This again, if you go, if you look at a Google Doc and how headings are used in that doc, you can easily see uh, what uh, how the the um, uh, table of contents sort of looks to someone using a, a screen reader and how they're able to jump around in that. Let's turn now to visual disabilities and low vision. This page is easily read by a screen reader, but not by someone who has low vision. To compensate, two thirds of low vision users will magnify their screens by 200%. Some will do it as much as 400%, and you may be noticing another unintended consequence by having words and images only. Do you see sort of in the middle lower of the screen, it says now in HD? Now that it's being blown up, it's already starting to become pixelated the more it is magnified. And that is a big problem with using uh, text inside of an image. It's always best if you could have just raw text on the page and not in an image. Some Lou Vision users will actually invert the contrast because they prefer reading text on a black background. Now, in fact, black screens are coming sort of the, the vibe around here. Many um, people who use mobile and uh, desktop users like black screens now because they feel like it increases battery life or is less strain on the eyes. But notice how the blue text in the world's best-selling e-readers is sort of getting lost. To pass accessibility guidelines, we must provide sufficient contrast Four of these words pass the WCAG guidelines and four of them do not. Which of the four do you think would not? I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about that as we fade out. The bottom four failed, the top five, uh, top four passed, including 
green and red. Not only does color matter, but also the size matters in meeting WCAG guidelines. The uh, webaim.org is an organization that is at Utah State University, and they uh, have a wonderful website on all things accessibility. And this is one of the tools they have, and you can easily find it by just searching WebAIM contest, uh, contrast checker. And you just pop in your, your uh, color code, and it will tell you whether it passes or fails, fails, and you can slide the slider to determine exactly what color you need to have it to, to pass. Now, the larger the text, the easier it is to get them to pass. But to be compliant, you must meet at least WCAG AA. There are three levels of uh, WCAG, uh, and is WCAG A, AA, and AAA. WCAG A is must have, WCAG AA is need to have, and WCAG AAA is nice to have, but you're not going to be not you're not going to be dinged for not being compliant with the AAA. Remember in our contrast test how green and red failed. They are especially difficult colors for those with color blindness to distinguish. So be careful in how you set up your next contest. Ensure sufficient contrast and don't rely on color alone to determine the success or not of answering a particular question. And it's always best to actually just use symbols. And one more tip, and this relates to links, it is best to always underline them for someone who can't see the blue. Let's turn now to cognitive and learning disabilities. These are things we need to be uh, concerned with as we go about creating our content. Be careful with movement and other distractions. Use good organizations such as we've talked about before, headings and lists. Focus on the important content for those with a learning disability to be able to focus more on simplifying our vocabulary. WCAG says readable, make it readable to users with a lower secondary reading level. Larger text improves readability. There, is, there are no text size guidelines in the, in the guidelines, but by a general rule, we try to stay above 16 points font and avoid long lines of length, long line length. Photosensitive epilepsy. Be mindful of those with this. It affects 3% of those with epilepsy. Fast flashing or strobing can set off a seizure and actually did during the 38th episode of Pokemon's first season in Japan. There was a scene where Pikachu used Thunderbolt on a cyber missile, and this caused the screen to flash red and blue rapidly. And as a result, there were seizures of 685 viewers that were taken to the hospital, and two remained hospitalized for more than two weeks. Be mindful of those with motor disabilities. Those with motor disabilities control navigation sometimes by voice. And as we continue to pick on Amazon, uh, imagine the frustration of trying to click learn more by using your voice. Links should be meaningful and should make sense all by themselves or its content. So in closing, online accessibility is all about creating content that allows assistive technology to make disabilities irrelevant. But you have to have a plan and really think it through. Thanks so much. Well, great, John. I think uh, I hope everybody got your uh, your punchline here on the last uh, on the last slide. You think it, it's worth unpacking for folks? Well, this is a picture of a building they built in Los Angeles that had a an ADA accessible ramp which goes nowhere when you get up to the staircase. And I, <laughs> to get, I don't know what the, I don't know what they were thinking, but there you go. There you go. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank, you. thank you so much, John, for that great information about not just how to make things accessible, but the why behind it and understanding the importance of remaining compliant. Mm -hmm. Our next speaker, Mr. Ray Carey. 
Yep, I'm here. Archive Social CEO, and he is the one who is going to be discussing all of the different ways that you can be making your social media even more accessible and compliant. Great. I guess it's it's over to me. So uh, first, thank you, uh, thank you, John. I know I learned a ton, and I think uh, r really one of the punchlines for me in that uh, I, I think you had a couple of great jokes with actual punchlines, but the the content punchline for me really was think about why you were doing this, not just how are you compliant, how do you get the check mark, but um, what's the why behind it, and trying to serve uh, folks with uh, that have different accessibility needs. And really make sure we're not uh, we're not just building ramps to the middle of staircases. <laughs> so um, I just want to take a step back uh, when it comes to sort of compliance and first ask the question. I hope with the folks that we have on uh, uh, the line that this would be a short topic. But the first is why does social media matter? Like so, why are we out there anyway? If we're not on social media, we don't have to talk about social media compliance. And the first is that while there are folks that um, uh, want to pick up the phone, stay on hold for 30 minutes and talk to a human. The issue that we're seeing here at Archive Social is they're just not making any more of those people. And so increasingly, if we want to engage with our citizens, we have to engage where they live and they live increasingly on social media. So uh, hopefully by by voting uh, uh, to be here, uh, you think that uh, that matters. This is the right way to engage with folks and and that it's important. The next question then is, and Jessica, if you hit the next slide, is um, really why do public records matter? So we're going to so we're switching gears here from the display compliance, if you will, and content creation compliance to public records compliance. That's the part of the the uh, the world that we operate in, and really fundamentally, and there's no time uh, uh, more than in a crisis, and in the crisis that we're in right now, where the importance of public record compliance, not just checkmark compliance, but why do we do it uh, uh, sort of inherently? The reason that we do it, in my mind, is that uh, the social media can be the Wild West. There's a ton of disinformation out there. Some of it is readable and some of it is not, uh, yeah, to, to borrow from uh, you know John's presentation. And some of it you can trust and some of it you can't trust. And fundamentally, one of the things that builds trust in our public institutions is you are on the permanent record. And so the idea of the permanent record uh, has been law for a, a long time with all different types of uh, communication channels. But I really wanted to get to the why. And the reason why we do that is somebody has to know in the wild west of social media, which streams do I trust? And those ones that are written for a permanent record subject to public records law really are the ones that you can rely on because you know we're not gonna change history sort of fundamentally. So if social media uh, uh, matters and public records matters, really that's why the compliance between these two and that gap is so important. And I wanna talk about uh, that, that gap and where you can run into some compliance gaps fundamentally. So next slide, Jessica, you have it? Great, so the first place is if you're not familiar with your public records law, um, these go back to the 1970s, but there are state by state public records law. There's also a federal public records law. Again, it was written before the internet, before email, before text messages, and certainly before social media. So it's the concept of anything that is created by a public entity is subject to the public records law, freedom of information requests, and certainly can be requested in e-discovery in a lawsuit. So if you look right here, this uh, bit.ly forward slash public records law, this is a resource that we've put together that you can click on your individual states because the, uh, the, the laws vary state by state. And not only in that resource can you understand the, the laws in your particular state, but we've put uh, on the side some policy, some policy templates. There's some uh, information around recent court cases that have happened. So uh, this is one place that, you know, after this call, you can go uh, download materials and use as a resource really to to understand not just we're going to talk sort of federally about public records law and compliance, but how it uh, complies specifically to your state. And some of that really is not only your state, but where you are. I'm not sure who's on the uh, the call here, but we have folks from law enforcement, we have folks from uh, schools and superintendents, uh, and we have folks that are social media managers for uh, their cities as well as clerks. So there's a little bit of different information depending on what part of sort of the public uh, sphere you operate in. So next slide, Jessica. 
Oh, I lost you. We're back. The Bitly does work. Okay, great. The Bitly does work. <laughs> so great. The first is how is social media different than a lot of other types of uh, records? So most of the folks on the phone will be uh, familiar that we've been archiving email for a long period of time. People are doing texting um, as well as sort of phone calls. And what, what's different about social media is that unlike an email where the chain of command is really clear, it starts with the creator and then it goes to the recipient and you have it. Um, social media, the actual creator, if it is a citizen, they can add, edit, and delete their comments all the time. So you can have a record from four or six or seven years ago, and that record can fundamentally change. So that, that sort of chain of custody of that record uh, isn't as clean as a DMARC when it moves from person to person. So that really makes it fundamentally different when it talks about complying with public records law and compliance in social media. Um, the second is these, this information doesn't reside on your servers or doesn't reside inside your data center. Um, these resides on the social media networks. I spend a lot of time out in California, not now, we are on a travel ban here at Archive Social, but uh, with Facebook and with Twitter and their government relations folks. And fundamentally, these social networks are not built for public institutions. There are 70,000 public institutions in the United States of America. There are 3 billion people on Facebook. They are not building the app for you. They're building it for private citizens. And as a, when you build something for a private citizen, when something is gone, you want it gone. <laughs> and that's fundamentally how they build things. And if you wanna use these tools to engage with your citizens, there's a fundamental gap. And that's really the issue um, certainly with subpoenas and things, you can go back and get some level of detail, but when they delete things, they delete them forever um, and they're ir irretrievable. And that doesn't mean you might not have to produce a public records request. It doesn't mean a potential litigant uh, in a court case hasn't screenshotted it and you need to know really what is it that happened? What did they screenshot and how do we produce that same record so we have the same information when we go in there? You know, should somebody, uh, you know, delete or comment or or sort of hide or block a poster? So, uh, next slide. So I'm just going to give a quick example of this. So I'll read through. So you have uh, Sabrina Mickelson who uh, works in Oregon um, for the. Uh, sorry, Sabrina Mickelson is an end user and has a question around a hunting license for uh, sort of her children. And so she asks a question and uh, uh, the Oregon uh, sort of fish and wildlife gets on and responds and says, geez, what really happened, right? If you guys can read into this, if you want, um, what happened, what verification was you need, where did you really get hung up? And is doing a great job really of citizen service in answering the question. And then Sabrina goes and responds again and says, well, they need my social security number. And down here at the bottom, if you guys read through and we can make this available to folks, you will see, um, that uh, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife says, no, it's a federal requirement that if uh, your son is gonna get a hunting and fishing license that we collect the social security number, right? The issue is we can have a policy and we have policy templates for you folks that say do not delete social media posts. The issue is it's not up to the Oregon Fish and Game. If the citizen deletes their own comment, it's gone. You might have to reproduce it. The issue is, all of the subcontents go away. So if the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife did not respond appropriately and said, give me your social security number, and that was in here, and then decided later, holy smokes, we just asked for PII, personal identifiable information, live on the worldwide uh, social networks, and deletes that, and someone later wants to have a public records request and say, what was that post that had to do with kids and guns and social security numbers and hunting regulations? Um, they're not gonna be able to produce it because Sabrina is the master commenter here, started it, and if she quits her social network, you'll see in point number three, if she edits or deletes it, she is in control of the public record, but the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife may be in a situation where they have to produce that record. That's the fundamental gap here uh, this is an example on Facebook, but it exists that way on fundamental just about every social network that we work with. So next slide. So does this happen a lot? 
that's the real question is are people deleting it or not so we went back we have 2500 uh, archives right now agencies that we're archiving for um, across the country but we've been growing sort of quickly so we went we needed to have a year's worth of data so we went back to the 2018 archive this is something that we did middle of last year and there we had 10 million social media posts collectively in the archive for the 500 folks that we had through that entire year um, of that 758,000 posts were deleted and so of the 10 million that's one out of 13 posts so it, in theory, people would say, like, can we take a screenshot of everything we do in every end users if you're a really small town? It might work if you're working 24 seven. One out of 13 ends up getting deleted is the sample set that we've seen with 500 you know, public agencies um, in 2018. Um, and the issue is when you are likely to get called on for a public records request is not a uniform time. It's when you were crazy and busy, <laughs> like now, that people wanna look back and say, how were things handled? So uh, it's, I would say, complicated at best in a uniform time, you know, potentially highly impossible when things are really busy and, and uh, kind of spinning out of control. Next slide. So three different ways to do this uh, for compliance. One, you can rely on the social networks. Uh, it's not a recommendation that we have. Uh, you know, our customers don't see that as a viable option. And frankly, we can talk to you about case law and settlements that have happened. If people say, well, I asked Facebook, they said they didn't have that. Um, fundamentally ends up not usually um, being a good compliance uh, sort of answer. You can take some, uh, screenshots. The issue is, did you screenshot the right thing at the right time? And not only did you screenshot it, do you have a organized system where you can find it? That's fundamentally what this third column is, is archiving software. That is fundamentally a system to, now we don't screenshot it, we take it out of the back of the APIs, but that gets you a way to get historical uh, deleted, edited, hidden comments, the metadata for legal situations around what it was and sort of replaying that social media. So fundamentally a way to stay compliant with your social media. Next slide. So summary, so first is, uh, uh, I hope you believe that social media is critical for engaging with your community. Not being on social media is a good compliance strategy. It's not a good engagement strategy. So that's first is uh, deciding for yourself whether you wanna engage in that way, uh, where your citizens live and expect to get information. I will tell you, if you're not doing as a city, somebody is. For cities that don't post to social media and have their own official page, oftentimes there's an unofficial page and it's not necessarily filled with accurate information. The second is that these networks were built for private citizens, not public compliance. And the third is that you need a strategy to sort of close that gap fundamentally and make sure you're in a position if somebody says, can we get a record of what happened on Twitter? Can we get a record of what happened on Facebook or on YouTube? And um, you know, the answer needs to be uh, yes and relatively easily. So I'm gonna, I think our next slide is um, uh, questions about this gap. So I think a poll is gonna pop up here. And if you have questions about public records in your, uh, in your state, so this is a quick poll and then we're gonna open up for overall questions and some have been sent in before. But if you have questions about, you know, what is somebody like me doing down the road or someone like me across the road? So we have New York City and we have, you know, Bear, Texas. So uh, if you want, you know, different size, different agencies, what are people like me doing? We can do that. And, uh, you know, thirdly, what's the legal situation? You know, what's the real sort of uh, uh, punchline here? So if you'd like to receive information around that, policy templates, what we're doing, uh, feel free to fill in this poll and I will make sure that our team follows up with you. Absolutely. So thank you, Ray. A lot of great information there. And then, uh, John, we'd love to bring you back on because we have questions. We have questions that came in beforehand and a few have popped up. So to start us off, this is a question for both of you. Any advice on remaining compliant even with multiple contributors? John, I'd invite you to, to take a crack at that. Okay, well, th there are services and tools, and uh, again, I'm, uh, I don't have uh, I don't have stock in any of these companies, but the one of the leading ones is called Site Improve, and they will scan your site and report out your broken links, your misspellings, your header issues, your pictures without alt tags, and uh, it, you know, 
when when uh, as we here at the uh, school division have we have like six webmasters throughout the division and it's it's hard to make sure that everybody is you know doing everything correctly but then we get the report and they can go back and and a punch list the uh, it, the issues that need to be punch listed <laughs> Great. And um, from a uh, records keeping, it really depends, I would say, on uh, which uh, we call them persona, which type of users uh, we are. Um, this idea of decentralization, multiple people publishing, really hits schools um, uh, uh, the most, but it's sort of everywhere. And that's because, you know, schools may all have their own Facebook page and they may all be publishing, but the records request oftentimes happens at the district level and the superintendent level. So the first thing is, have a really good policy. Number one, what are the rules of engagement when you have multiple different publishers? What what are you supposed to do and not supposed to do? Like deleting is a no. Um, you know, when can you block a user because you can't yell, you know, the equivalent of fire in a movie theater? There are times with hate speech and other times when you can block a user, but when are you risking trampling First Amendment rights? So have a view on it, have a policy where happy to share uh, policies that our customers have given us to share uh, about that. Um, train against the policy. Um, I don't know your experience, John, but I don't know, everything I've written out to my uh, colleagues and constituents doesn't always get read and just automatically done. <laughs> it's not been my experience. So uh, train, train, train against the policy. And then the third thing is uh, have tools for compliance. So. Um, I have to answer the question differently because I do own stock in this compliance. I do work at Archive Social, it's my job, but we do have a tool for policy enforcement um, that can scan your uh, social media and pick up if people are doing, and get alerted to if people are stepping outside of, uh, uh, outside of their policy. But uh, it all starts with having a good plan of what you'd like your distributed publishers to do in the first place. Absolutely, making sense. Uh, so our next question just popped in. I've been told that closed captioning on YouTube is not considered compliance. How can YouTube videos be made to be compliant and is YouTube working on making it more compliant, John? Well, that's uh, AI. Uh, and AI has gotten a lot better in the last couple of years, but it's still not perfect. Uh, the way we do it here is we have, uh, I have a team of uh, three uh, college uh, kids and one late teenager who will go into the back end of our YouTubes after like a school board meeting and uh, correct the uh, YouTube record. We have a, a, we are one of the school divisions that uh, had an OCR, an Office of Civil Rights lawsuit filed against it, one of like 700 or 800 in the country. And uh, as part of the OCR uh, settlement, we agreed to have our, uh, our uh, uh, video captions uh, brought up to compliance within 30 days of it actually being posted to, to YouTube. So there is some flexibility that can be had there too. But uh, closed captioning houses, they sometimes can go between a dollar and three dollars a minute. Um, so it can it can get expensive when you're running like a four or five hour meeting. Wow, I can imagine. Uh, our next question came in beforehand. What are uh, explicit legal requirements from the ADA on social media. Um, you talked a little bit about it, but are there any specific things that people need, to, that you see as practicing uh, that they need to fix like today? I'm, I'm not a lawyer, and so I would hate to give legal advice and um, all the training that uh, we go through every year uh, with the, learning the new things and accessibility. They all say it's coming down the pike, but right now the ADA is only uh, the lawsuits have only recognized websites as being a part of ADA. I believe the there's a famous one, and Ray, maybe you can help me out here. I was thinking one of the the major pizza chains, uh, Domino. Domino's. Yeah. yeah, they had to fight their own uh, lawsuit against that, uh, uh, saying that they weren't uh, they're not you know federally funded or met any of the other guidelines. But the the lawsuit came out and said, no, you got to make it uh, accessible. I remember reading about that one. Uh, so this one's for both Ray and John. Do you have any advice on sharing community information on district social media? Any, um, this is going back a little bit to our policies and procedures, but specifically on kind of what you share and how you share it. We share across, I'm sorry, go ahead, Ray. 
No, John, I was going to invite you. You're uh, you're doing it every day. <laughs> uh, we have uh, we're a small school division that has five schools. Each of them has a Twitter account. We have one division Facebook that each of the five schools can post to, and the division posts to. Uh, we also have a, an app, and uh, we also have uh, SMS uh, text messaging. And so we're hitting hitting all of those all the time with uh, with you know everything from school is out because of the coronavirus to uh, here's you know the PTA meeting tonight's gotten canceled or here's the live stream of uh, our um, of our school board meeting we do that on uh, YouTube as well uh, and by the way we don't have uh, as part of our OCR um, as part of our OCR thing we we also got the um, uh, they let us off the hook for having to have live captions, even though that is part of the WCAG. Uh, we we still also have to have the live the captions up within 30 days of the meeting. So I don't know if that answered the question, but we're blasting out all the time, and we find it being transparent and keeping uh, our citizenry well informed. Then that uh, has reduced a lot of a lot of problems with angst in the community. Yeah, I would. Uh, I'd go back, Jessica. You you mentioned the word policy is to sit down and start with a good policy. What is it that you are looking to do? Um, what is your uh, uh, demographic and what does your user base look like? Um, right now, you can reach more people uh, faster, and there's somewhat less compliance uh, from a uh, personal information and. Um, uh, cell phone number policy to social media versus texting. Um, texting definitely can be done, but you got to be a little bit careful about collecting uh, students' um, uh, uh, phone numbers. Uh, that's generally sort of a parent and an opt-in thing. Uh, social media, you can kind of start tomorrow, um, uh, at least from a data privacy perspective. And uh, really, it's uh, how do you think you're going to uh, reach your reach your folks? And then the type of things that you post, really the uh, the the the, you know, there's no limit to the type of things that, that you can post. It really has to do with, um, you know, how you're funded. Uh, it is important, I think, in social media uh, to be able to be engaging and responsive to folks. So we have seen people trying to staff and post to the level of which they can try to keep up with the engagement in the comments. It is a two-way platform. Um, and that's one thing that as you move from announcements, bulletins, websites to social media, People are going to talk back. And so I would say the main thing is prepare for a, uh, you know, prepare for it for an environment where it's going to be a two way conversation, whether you meant it to be that way or not. And Ray, you had a great point uh, earlier, too. Such a good point that you need to grab your social media accounts, even if you don't even if you don't plan to use them that often, you need to grab them so that your account can be the official voice of you and not someone, uh, some some guy down the street who wants to talk for you. Yeah, and there is a process and we'd be happy to around trying to recover your account, but boy, is it a process. So <laughs> uh, it's not for it's not for the faint of heart uh, to do the, uh, the sort of verification that you're you, uh, but it, it can be done. So if you're not yet through that and it's available, uh, I agree with John. Uh, 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 grab it and squat on it, at yep. least. <laughs> uh, so we have a graduate student in the audience today, and they have a question. I'm currently conducting research on accessibility on social media for my government or my graduate program. Excuse me. What government sites would you recommend for policies around social media? The sites I've viewed have been lacking. Well, I'm gonna. Uh, I, I guess I'm gonna humbly say, um, please start with our Bitly site from this, um, uh, uh, you know, site. Uh, I will tell you there is a um, government social media Facebook group. Jessica, what is the uh, uh, GSM uh, GSM Con? Um, yeah. I don't know if you can uh, send that. So if you if we get this individual's email, we'll be happy to send out. Um, they unfortunately, we had a big conference that was to uh, was due this week, uh, government social media conference, um, and that user group is really vibrant and active, and I say is a great place to go. Um, so I may start with GSMCon's uh, Facebook user group and our uh, our Bitly sites as, as places to start, um, and also uh, uh, Jessica, I'll invite you to answer that question too because you do a lot of this research for us at Archive Social. Anything else you'd add for this grad student? 
Absolutely. So the GSMCon uh, Facebook group, I'm actually not sure if a graduate student would be allowed into it. It is a resource for all people that are currently working in the government sector in public communicators, but they also give great information. So if you can get into it, it is a phenomenal group of phenomenal people. And if you people. send me an email, uh, whoever that is, I'm, I'm uh, ray.carry at Archive Social. Uh, I will tell Christy to let you in. People who are doing research about this, we should let in. So uh, shoot me an email, ray.carry at archivesocial.com. Uh, uh, Christy runs that group, and uh, I, I will ask her. Obviously, it's it's her group. But uh, if you're doing some research, uh, we applaud people who are working on this topic. So let me know if Absolutely. I can help. Absolutely. Sorry, we it. also <laughs> have uh, Mountain View, California. Uh, Katie Nelson does some amazing work there. Uh, in Round Rock, Texas, we have Austin Ellington. He does phenomenal work. Brett White in West Hollywood, if you want something a little bit more off the extreme path. And so we have some amazing customers, and they also are constantly just part of this agency to agency webinar series. If you look on their websites and where they're posting, and you'll find some great information through them as well. All right. Uh, next question is for both. Uh, you mentioned the picture, but getting people to notice and read the post is a huge issue. All the social media platforms advise pics or videos to get people to read the post. Goal number one, video is not the solution to everything. I'm really hoping the best practices you advise are not only good for ADA, but they will yield strong analytics in terms of viewership. So John, any advice on towing the line between trying to get those metric numbers and those views and trying to remain compliant well just, just think about it the more you can do to make any content accessible to the widest amount of people where they can see hear uh, operate with their their uh, their hands uh, anything the more you can get content into them then of course that's going to be uh, up your score uh, uh, we've seen at, at our uh, school division by going from a non-compliant website to a compliant website, we've seen a great amount of SEO in our, I mean, you can, we, we put up a page now uh, or, or today or something, it will automatically be found on Google like almost instantly. It, it has really helped with, with search results and SEO just by following the guidelines put out by WACA. Gotcha. And I'll just do a quick uh, shout out. The uh, uh, Jessica, you're going to tell me if we did this or it's upcoming. I uh, uh, I get confused sometimes. We get so much going on. But uh, uh, Allie, uh, who used to run the social media for Austin, she's now moved to another city. Uh, she mm -hmm. was going to put on a webinar around beating the algorithm. Um, and yeah. uh, so, the, you know, one of the big issues here is it's not just about what you post. It's about getting seen. And uh, it is that that's a longer topic. So in the uh, the interest of time, I probably won't go into it. But I would invite you to uh, contact us and happy to talk about strategies, not just for having great content, but getting that content seen on Facebook. Because we all know content's only as good as the person can read it, whether that's for accessibility or it's because it gets above the fold <laughs> on their uh, 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 you know on their timeline. So. Um, yeah. Uh, I would invite you to do that. John, I'm sorry, you had a comment. I was just going to say, uh, we've seen a, a huge increase in engagement of our videos on Facebook when they are captioned. So that, you know, as you're scrolling through your feed, you're actually seeing the words before you actually hear them talk. And that, that really uh, boosts engagement. Yeah. John, how did you convince your school district that you needed the staff to work in social media? Uh, we don't have a staff to work in social media. We have we have uh, uh, principals and other staff that do social media. That's that's pretty much it. We don't have a, a social media manager. So even those teams of one can be very mighty. As that's correct. Show. That's correct. <laughs> our uh, our web uh, platform allows for uh, moderation. So we actually have some students who are creating uh, content that eventually will get tweeted out, but it gets tweeted out after it's checked over. Um, and we use those guys for like when they go uh, to sports games and uh, soccer and basketball is huge in our division. And so they're constantly updating us with their scores. 
Fantastic. Always great to see the students involved in this. So I'd like to, we are just about at the top of the hour. I'd like to say a thank you and last thank you to John Brett. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be here. And to Ray Carey for their time and expertise. It's the first webinar I've done with an Emmy Award winner. So, John, <laughs> thank you very much. I feel like I leveled up my game. So, thank you. With a, with a dog named Grover. There we go. Dog named Grover. Great. Thanks, everybody. Signing off. If you'd like to learn more about John and his work, there will be a follow-up email with additional resources coming at you within the next 48 hours. And I would like to invite all of you to our next Agency to Agency webinar in April, specifically April 7th, where we discuss COVID-19 and all of the best resources online. Thank you for your time and have a great day.